That's Newstalk.com. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. You can find our lowest car insurance price online, guaranteed. Strong winds increasing to gale force in western areas this afternoon and evening with severe and damaging gusts developing, especially in the southwest. There's also potential for coastal flooding. Top temperatures 6 to 8 degrees. Now you're up to date on News Talk. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Now, welcome along. So, with the change schedule this afternoon, we're going to squeeze in the Sunday papers as best we can. It might be slightly shorter than usual, but we'll squeeze it in as best we can between a kickoff in the Premier League at half past four. We're joined in studio by Philip Quinn, who you'll read in the Irish Daily Mail and the Mail on Sunday. And we have Bernard Jackman as well, Heineken Cup winner with Leinster, Irish International, a coach at Grenoble and the Dragons. And now, Bernard, I was just saying there, a tie wearing, suit wearing <laughs> schmuck like the rest of us. And I'm enjoying it. Welcome <laughs> to reality. Exactly, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, um, it's been good, it's been a good transition. And uh, yeah, it's totally uh, imposter syndrome. Um, I'm suffering from that every day, but uh, it's getting less and less. And yeah, I'm, in, I'm enjoying the real I world. I think so. There's a, the voice in your head who says you're just here because you're a Bernard Jackman rugby player, you have to shoot that guy down a little bit. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. No, um, yeah, I, I think coaching is a very fickle career. Um, obviously, you know, I know that better than most people, and uh, that's that where my family are at, my kids, my wife. Um, I just need some stability, and you know, getting on a plane and and, and commuting from France or Wales or or the UK wasn't what we needed to do at, uh, at this time. And um, it's good to prove I can do something else as well. I never started off to be a professional rugby player; it just kind of happened. Coaching, I, I am massively passionate about, and I'm still getting um, to to fulfil that passion through through working with Bective and, and obviously working in the media. But yeah, I need to prove that I can do something um, outside of sport and I'm getting to do that at the moment. Well, I've no doubt you will. I heard you speaking on, I think it was a rugby podcast, I think a UK one maybe about a year ago or at some stage in the last 18 months. And you were making the point in that interview that you're at an age now where you felt you could give rugby coaching another bash. Maybe you go in as a head coach again or maybe you go in as part of a team. Yeah. And if that doesn't work out, you could find yourself in five, six, seven years and you might be at an age where it would be really difficult to get into the real world. That was your thinking. Yeah, and I've spoken to some coaches um, who are, are suffering a little bit and are on the outside. And um, at 43, um, I was lucky I came back to, come back to Dublin. Um, there's a lot of companies willing to give, were willing to give me a chance um, and see me as being not uh, young enough um, to, to transition. Whereas maybe at 53, that wouldn't be the case, and uh, you know that's that's the reality of it. And um, still have enough time to hopefully be successful in in other areas, or come back to coaching if that's well, what I want. I, I, you I know, doubt, yeah. um, but just good to be involved in something that I'm enjoying and um, getting to getting to hopefully prove myself in a different industry. I asked this as a journalist, Philip. You'll understand. Did you struggle with the insecurity that was held in the future? No, I didn't really, but uh, I could sense that it wasn't great for for my family. You know, I, I would always back myself to. To make a living, um, but what you want to be in a, is in a career where your family aren't worried about whether you win on Saturday. Mm. You know, as much as obviously it affects me as well, but um, that's the issue: is just having that stability uh, for your for your close ones more so than, than myself. Mm. Well, I'm sure you'll be very successful whatever you choose to do. Okay. I'll start with headlines then, and as you can imagine, and Philip, you were at the press conference on Friday. Front page of the Sunday Independent News section, FAI crisis, Varadkar now ready to step in. So the Taoiseach, uh, quoted courtesy of the Sunday Independent, speaking to the paper last night, will definitely try to ensure that grassroots schoolboys and women's football doesn't suffer. This has gone right to the very top of Irish life, this situation. We have the Sunday Times again, main section, obviously. So much of what's happened this year started in the Sunday Times on their front pages. Cab and tax experts study FAI accounts. This is John Mooney and Mark Tye. So it seems that the Criminal Assets Bureau is being assembled by Garda headquarters to investigate the financial affairs of the FAI. And interestingly, they say, the inquiry will examine whether the expenses paid by the FAI to its former chief executive, John Delaney, should have been declared as taxable income. That is one of the things they are looking into. Sunday World, this was dreadful last night. The Manchester Derby. Bottlers, and the picture is of items being thrown at Manchester United player Fred. City embarrassed at home as fans throw missiles at victorious United. Beneath that, by the way, Sexton, Six Nations worry after injury. He went off with a knee injury, was being iced on the side of the field yesterday against Northampton. A scan will tell us more, but it looked <coughs> serious-ish, you would have to say, concerning. 
back page of the mirror. Again, it's Manchester City 1, Manchester United 2. Hit and miss. Again, a picture of Fred here. What a disgrace, they say. Fred after being hit by an object. And above, the fan alleged to have been involved in racial, racial abuse. And they have a small picture here. It's pixelated, so I'll hold it up to the camera. But the fan who on, was caught on camera making a monkey gesture to Manchester United players. Mail on Sunday then. Manchester United again, a race storm. United's derby win is overshadowed by shameful abuse. That's Chris Wheeler here. And again, a pixelated picture. Angry City set to investigate racism. And you can see uh, pretty clearly here, the gesture is, is unmistakable. And it was discussed to their credit on Sky Sports afterwards. Gary Neville was even referencing Boris Johnson's performance in the leaders' debate the night before as fueling what's been a grim three years over on that side of the pond. Meanwhile, Sunday Independent, Dog and Munster survive uh, both a dismissal to hold on for victory. This was Munster beating Saracens by 10 points to three. And beneath that, Shane Phelan says, hopes of resolution fade in Mayo funding row. And then finally, Sunday Times Sport. Picture here in the top right. We'll get to Anthony Joshua if we can. Various reports on his performance last night. They have uh, Christmas Comes Early and a picture of Marcus Rashford. United follow-up win over Jose by beating Neighbours and leaving City 14 points off the top. And then the reports on the rugby yesterday, Ireland enjoy English Triple Crown. Darcy in the running for top Dublin job as well. So Declan Darcy, says Michael Foley, who has a great interview inside with Ono Gara, which we'll hopefully touch on. Declan Darcy has emerged this weekend as a strong contender alongside Desi Farrell to succeed Jim Gavin. And he mentions, as I'm sure you might have seen, Pat Gilroy confirmed last week his unavailability due to work commitments. And then here again, probe into racial abuse of players. Manchester City uh, working with police after allegations of racial gestures uh, being directed towards Manchester United players were made last night. Uh, they talk about the 68 minute when Fred was heading over to take a corner and then they also reference one supporter could be seen on Sky Sports coverage making what appeared to be a monkey chant and gesture in the direction of Jessica Lingard who was close by. The closest City player was Raheem Sterling who has been an outspoken critic of racism in the English game. Later on Ole Gunnar Solskjaer said, I've seen it on video, it was Jesse and Fred and the fella must be ashamed of himself, unacceptable, and he said that the racist abuse perpetrator should be banned for life, simple as that, said Solskjaer. I'm sure you've been over to Manchester numerous times, both of you in your sporting careers, it is a multinational city, it is a very liberal city, it's a great city in so many ways, and yet you have idiots like this. It was quite shocking really when you first saw it on camera captured so clearly and so perfectly because stadiums are so well lit now yeah. you see this guy and in a weird way because he was wearing a gilet stood out. The, the red arms against the black jacket stood out and he was doing it in the most subtle way but the most disgusting way and you just wanted to throttle him and you just think Raheem Sterling is standing yeah. right there your own player and this is the carry-on. The only positive is he's, he's been caught, yeah. and it's so clear-cut. Uh, I saw his company, he's been named uh, online, his company have come out and said they know the allegations there, uh, the company he works for, nice. and they're going to investigate it. So, again, it, it's absolutely disgraceful, it's happened, but you know, the only thing that we can do is make sure that any time it, comes, it happens, that the action is swift and, and, and hard, and hopefully, it's going to take a long time. Well, it looks like it's going to take a long time to get it out. But um, the more, the more when we catch someone red-handed like that, that the scrutiny is on him, and you know the punishment is, is very severe. And in fairness, I heard Solskjaer talking about it and just said it's coming up all the time, and you just can't understand how, you know, it continues to be, to happen. But listen, uh, we have to we have to make sure that it's not tolerated, mm. and it, at least and it's, at least he's been caught. Absolutely, and. In the post-match chat, Jamie Redknapp made the correct point, it's a societal issue, yeah. and Gary Neville picked up on that and said, yeah, and I watched the leaders' debate, and I watched what Boris Johnson had to say, and I didn't like it, and I haven't liked the last three years. And then Roy Keane, as he so often does, can get to the nub of a situation, and he simply said, there are always a few idiots everywhere, and there always probably will be. So that's why it's difficult for football to totally get rid of it. It is. Uh, I watched it as it happened, and um, you know, I'm a Man City fan for 50 years and um, leaving aside the football side of it. And the better team won yesterday, make no mistake. Yeah. Um, it, it, was, it was pretty pretty awful to see what happened. And when you see the Manchester United player as well, Fred, he's been hit in the back of the head by something. Um, so you have the racist abuse, you have the violent act towards uh, um, opposition players. And Manchester City fans have a very good reputation over the years, yeah. uh, but it only takes a couple, as Roy Keane says, it only takes a couple of idiots. Um, 
the, whatever the crowd was over 50,000 people there, so you, you know you could have 49,000 people were fine, and one or two fellas, or one or two people let, let the club down and let themselves down, um, and it was shocking. It was shocking, um, and, I, and I'm delighted to hear that action has been taken. The city are cooperating, mm -hmm. and that the person who made that gesture should be banned from football for life, mm -hmm. and the person who threw the object, um, I think actually it was a suggestion might have been a, a, fire, a lighter. Uh, a sure lighter, that, which could have caught somebody in the eye. Yeah. They should be barred from football for yeah. life. It was. It took. It took the glass off. Actually, what was an outstanding performance by Manchester United yesterday? Solskjaer got his tactics spot on. Yeah. He realised City were slow at the back, and he, he backed his defence to sort of muzzle, muzzle City, and then he countered quickly at pace. James Rashford, Martial, City's ageing, creaking defence, and, and, and no reply. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but it, it did gloss over what was. Uh, it, sh it, sh it shouldn't take away from what was a, a very, a very disturbing and, 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 and difficult moment for football. Yeah. And you know what? You know what? Joe, a couple of days ago, remember the headline in the Italian paper, yeah. Black Friday, above the, the Lukaku and um, Smalling were playing mm. against one another. You know, and this is this is a newspaper you're supposed to be leading by example, and they're putting this on a headline. And again, that was completely and they've stood over wrong. and they've stood over and tried to argue that they're, 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 they're celebrating Sorry. difference and and it was a good thing. So that's yeah. where we are on that front. I don't think the players thought it was great. There's lots for us to get through in the time we have so uh, there's more Joe Schmidt World Cup talk because of the Rory Best comments and there are a few comments during the week there's a great interview with Don O'Gara you mentioned as well Philip there Michael Darren McCauley's been interviewed Johnny Evans is in the Sunday Times there's Joshua Ruiz there's a Paul Kimmage piece I think that it's important we reference as well and, and touch on but we have to start with the FAI which is on the front pages everywhere main sections uh, so the Sunday Times uh, front page, just to expand on what I mentioned there, that uh, the Criminal Assets Bureau assembled by Garda headquarters to investigate the financial affairs of the FAI. They want to see whether or not the expenses paid by the FAI to former Chief Executive John Delaney should have been declared as taxable income. They will also seek to establish whether the association met its obligations under the Companies Act. They go on to say that it also emerged that the FAI paid Delaney previously unreported personal expenses of 295000 in 2016. 74,000 in 2017 and 206,000 last year, including payments for Delaney's 50th birthday, hotel bills and credit card expenditure, including cash withdrawals. And they did make the point, though, that the FAI's payment of 69,000 for Delaney's 50th birthday in 2017 was, part, was being counted now as part of Delaney's re remuneration, that the former chief executive is understood to have repaid 50,000 to the FAI for the event. There was a, and I know you were at the press conference, yep. Philip. Important point to, to make here, and it's you, it's touched on very well in the mail, actually. It might be the best place to mention it, but Dick Shakespeare was there. Yeah. And he's a, a Dublin City Council senior official. Figure. Yeah, senior figure. And he spoke, and just his comments jumped out at me. So this is just uh, a point from Friday. Shakespeare hears Enron echoes in FAI shenanigans, and this is the piece you wrote, Philip, and he's talking here about and there was a myriad of things going on in the, in the accounts. But the FAI received 6.5 million from Mike Ashley's Sports Direct as a payment to become the new FAI kit sponsors. Only the deal should never have gone through as the FAI were already tied to a legally binding contract mm. with another company who cried foul. So now the FAI have to pay back 100,000 a month to Sports Direct. And here's the incredible thing. Shakespeare felt the arrangement revived echoes of the Enron scandal of 2001. He said, in terms of the Sports Direct thing, that is the big swing, the big swing being in terms of the amount of money that they thought they owed and now they do owe. That would potentially be an Enron type of exercise. That would probably be the most disappointing p piece on that one. Basically, you were booking an income stream in one year that you were selling, but you were selling your future. If the FAI are 6.5 million in, then you have got to unwind that. It is an effective doubling of the debt in the accounts. Paul Cook would better, better on that than me. But Enron was on a far greater scale, but that is what it reminded me of when I first heard about it. I thought, that was a bit Enron-ish. Yeah, Enron uh, is a byword for the biggest scandal or close to it in, in financial history and we're seeing something Enron-ish crop up in Shakespeare's opinion at the FAI. Mm. The general mood on Friday, was it a bit surreal? Was it downbeat? People may not have seen it, they've only read about it. Uh, it, it the general mood was uh, one of sort, of sort of shock and awe what we, what we were hearing. Because um, the FAI have never sort of laid bare their, their financial affairs at that before. They basically put it on the slab and said, look, here, pick away at the corpse. Um, the Enron connection, which came up 
afterwards when Dick Shakespeare spoke to a few a few journalists. Um, and he, he's a bright guy, and he's got a good job in the Dublin City Council, he knows what he's talking about, and he knows he would have learned, as he said, he learned all about integrity from the late, great Tony O'Neill, uh, who's sorely missed and was the, the greatest administrator the FEI have ever had, actually from the moment he left the FEI in 1990. And I touch upon this in the piece in the mail that there's been a series of crises, we've stumbled from crisis to crisis. But the Enron deal was they basically hid billions of dollars from failed projects and debts and they just kept them away from the public and then it was exposed and the whole thing collapsed. And they actually brought down a very big accounting firm as well who were sort of came on board and uh, went along with it and then they were exposed. Um, and I don't know what more is to come. I, I, I think I, my fear is that you know we haven't got to the bottom of this. And when you see the Sunday Times mentioning the cab were involved, I mean... That report from Cozy Accountants went straight to the Garda headquarters in Harcourt Street, is where, where their fault squad are based. Yes, and we can't um, speculate. We can't speculate, all. but you can certainly speculate, Joe, that there's more to come. You can speculate there's more to come. Yeah. What was the mood like? The mood, it was a very warm room on, on Friday. It was too warm. We actually, we actually later in the day, we actually opened up the. We were, I was there for two and a half hours, and we opened up the windows, and we opened up the side doors, and um, just a little bit of air in. And uh, Donald Conway came in, and it was supposed to start at twelve, then we put back to one, and then the. Uh, Paul Cook and the board members came in at about 20 past one, 22 minutes past one, and they sat down, and there was another seven minutes while the central chair was empty, and you're kind of waiting for the president to come in. And he comes in, and he's a very, Donald is a very composed, sort of articulate, sort of calm man, and uh, I got the impression he was a little bit flustered, because he came in and he said, good morning, everyone. Hmm. And it was 1.29. And uh, I, I kind of thought, he, he's in a little bit of a haze, because he kind of knows what's coming. Um, I'll give the FEA a certain amount of credit. They did say, look guys, these are the figures. Yes. And they put panels up and you're able to sort of go through it and you're going millions here, millions there, millions there. There's so much been talked about, but on the Sunday papers, to get back to it, you mentioned there the Sunday Times on the front page and I was just in the sums there, you know, about the, um, the, the John Delaney's previously unreported personal expenses for three years and they come to 575,000 euros personally personal expenses. And on top of this, there was a deal that he signed in 2014 for around €3 million. Euro. Mm. I mean, Loyalty this, bonus. This is an association that's broke. And, and they're, they're, they're writing, they're basically guaranteeing their chief executive, on top of his salary and on top of his, 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 his allowance. I'm kind of wondering, you know, did anybody ever think to stop and cry, hang on guys, blow the whistle. Shh. Match is over here. Can we just take a, take a long, hard look at where we're going? Um, we can jump around quite a lot, Joe, but it your is, initial question was yeah. about the mood. Yeah. The mood was sombre. Yeah. There was honesty um, and there was an admission of, of wrongdoing, but unfortunately I thought it was the time for Donald to do it. He didn't do it. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to ask you about he that. He didn't so offer an apology. A few papers, various journalists make that point that Donald Conway was offered the chance to just apologise and he decided not to. How much pressure was he put under to apologise? No, Do you remember that I, I actually exchange? Asked, I think, you said I, it. I'd asked him back in October and he said he, he, he said he'd, he'd declined to and he, and he said he didn't believe in apologies. Yeah, and he spoke course, about... Yeah. Um, um, uh, the quote is actually, if I have it here. You have it in your piece, uh, do you? Yeah, he, he, said, uh, he said... It's not that I'm against apologies. Yeah, but he the apology he, thing yeah. doesn't weigh with me. He says, I don't think it's a particularly meaningful act. And I said, for many, my own words, it is meaningful, and it wouldn't have cost Conway much to apologise on Friday. Not for, certainly not for 62.3 million. Uh, and by the way, that latter figure is what their liabilities are at the moment. Mm. Um, and I kind of thought, you know, just say sorry. Just say, I took my eye off the ball and I should have been more diligent, and I'm sorry. It doesn't take much to say that, uh, but he declined to go down that road, well, and, he, and he, I think he, he should have. He might argue he didn't take his eye off the ball, but the figures are pretty damning, that's for sure. He said he wasn't given the right information, but he should yes. have asked the questions. Uh, I was shocked, to be honest. The FAI's financial shame laid, laid bare. That's page three of the Business Post. Roisin Burke here again, like a lot of journalists going through the various figures, which mm -hmm. are eye-watering. Do you feel Conway was later asked by RTE you have served Irish football well. I do, he said, detailing his Trojan work on the underage game and I on emerging talent. Question, did you? It says, or, well, RTE did as well, and player development programmes. <laughs> um, is this rock bottom, someone asked? Yeah, and Cook said yes. We think, we so. think so. We yeah. think so. We're at the beginning of a new dawn for football, Shakespeare said. There's a, there's a lot, of, lot of stuff in a lot of papers, and another one... Um, you're in, the, you're in the Sunday Business Post, yeah, I mean, Cook, Paul Cook was involved in the paper before. Um, yeah. uh, the Sunday, Sunday World have, a, have a, on the front page um, a Brian Kerr strap line, um, which talks about the um, um, money being, soul destroying for Irish football, and money being frittered away in a devious, devious way. That's Brian Kerr's quote. Yeah. The Sunday Business Post, I think, uh, well, on the, on the front ear, on the top left-hand side, FAI and survival battle on Delaney's legacy of excess. As Delaney's legacy of excess is exposed, Inside the Sunday Indo, then you have, you have a full page of comment. Eamon Sweeney, John Green and John Fallon. Eamon Sweeney talks about the, the Vantage Club being the, the sort of the noose that basically 
you know, was wrapped around Ireland's football neck, yeah. football's neck, and it was Delaney who drove that that plan. And he said it was clear that that, that when that collapsed, because the prices were ridiculously high, and it, and you must remember the FEI were given a chance. They were given. They were offered by a third party. Said, "We'll give you the money for the, all the all the seats, and we'll go and sell the ten-year tickets, and there's no risk for you." And they said, "No, we'll sell the seats, and we'll keep the profits." And when that collapsed, Sweeney makes the makes the point that it was clear that the wrong man was in charge, and yet Delaney stayed in charge for another, another and, eleven years. Because it's interesting, John Green as it comes at it from a different angle, and it's an interesting read as well, where he talks yeah. about the efforts really to try and find out what was going on down the years. And he talks about a piece Tommy Conlon even wrote 12 months ago, and mm. Tommy made the very fair point in his piece 12 months ago. In 06, the GA's turnover year, over was 30 million, by 2017, 65 million. 07, the RFU's turnover was 48 million, by 2017, 85 million. FAI in 2007, 45 million, 2017, 49 million. In other words, Tommy wrote, the IRFU and GEA have raced ahead of the FAI in terms of financial performance over the last decade, and yet the CEO of the worst performing organisation is paying himself by far the most money. And this drew massive annoyance from Delaney, says John Green. He phoned, he demanded apology, said his family had been upset with the contents. In a rare insight, writes John to his more ruthless side, he questioned Tommy's fitness for the job as a columnist, saying his piece lacked humanity, empathy and accuracy. The Sunday Independent stood over the piece the decision to publish it, those words, writes John, humanity, empathy and accuracy ring very hollow this weekend. He does reference you, Philip, along with Dion, Paul Rowe and Paul Lennon and others who Paul chipped Hyland. away for years, Paul Hyland, yes, excuse me, chipped away for years and tried to get answers and, and weren't so sure what was going on. Would I be right in saying, and correct me if I'm wrong because it's a bit before my time, that when John Delaney first came on the scene, you would have had high hopes for him and you would have thought this guy has the potential to be the great reformer. Yeah. And if that was the case, how quickly did you start to think this, this ain't quite what I was hoping for? I think John had a conversion at some point along his journey. I don't know when, but I would have met him first of all back in the late, in, oh, back in the early 90s, uh, before when his father was treasurer. Um, and we, we, we came quite close as he rose up the ranks of the FAI. I was there the night he became a treasurer, uh, the youngest treasurer of this association. We were down in Cork, we, we drank away the evening that night and we were, great, we were good pals. And then um, he, he, the Saipan, he, he emerged from that as sort of the, yes. as a, this is this, he sees his opportunity for Saipan. And for the first couple of years, he was excellent, Joe. He really was, because the FBI did need new leadership. It did need somebody who was young and dynamic and had ideas. And John had all those things. And he was a personal guy. And uh, he was good with the media. And he, he did sort of bring a sense of order um, and control to an, an organization that was, had an image of sort of, you know, cloth cap and bicycle clips, you know, and Merrion Square at the railings there. Mm -hmm. And he oversaw the move to Abbastown, which was a good move. And funny enough, that was, that was um, the anniversary of that was this, this week as well. I was ever thinking Jakers. Platini opened that in Abbastown, I think it was 2007. Mm -hmm. And here we are 12 years back on the exact anniversary and things aren't as good as they were back then. But somewhere along the line, I think John just, I don't know what happened to him, but maybe it was a gradual thing. But he'd be just, he, he became sort of like, um, a sort of a, an emperor, um, a, a Caesar, one of the great sort of Caesars, and he became sort of, he sort of said that all, all things in football come through him, and he became above everybody else, and he became arrogant, and he became a bit distrustful of friends as well, and he marginalised a lot of good people, and Brian Kerr makes that point as well in one of the pieces, that a lot of good people left the FEI in the last 14 years and weren't replaced by better ones. And, and then I, I kind of lost a bit with John a little bit because I wrote something he didn't like and he rang me up and okay. he said, you know, you and I go back a long way. I said, we do, John, but I have to write what I think is the truth. And um, it, it may not portray you or the FAI in the proper light, but if I feel it's the truth, I'm going to put it to print. And, uh, and he said, well, that may be the end of, of us in terms of... John's a very good source for stories, and um, as, as journalists can confirm for many years afterwards. And he just had to bite the bullet. And, and other guys, Paul Holland, who was digging away as hard as I was, and Paul Rohn and, and Dion, who came around a little bit, I think, and did a very good interview with John after year 2012. Yeah, 2012, yeah. Uh, and Paul Lennon of the star as well. And it wasn't easy for us, Joe. I can tell you, there were phone calls made to us. And one person rang me in the FAI and said, you know, numbers are being watched here. Who's ringing who? And just be careful type thing. It wasn't quite a warning, but you kind of felt you were, you'd be careful that who you spoke the to. Yeah. And, and people were advised not to talk. Um, but somewhere along the line, uh, John went from being a sort of a, working for the association to, I believe, not quite working for himself, but he saw himself as, you know, the Sun King, yeah. and, and also he was totally impervious to criticism. Well, he will dispute that, I'm sure, as is his right, and I'm sure we'll hear from him in the coming well, I asked what his legacy was. I asked Paul Cook what was, what was John Delaney's legacy, mm. and he kind of said, well, this is a dark day for the Irish football, and, uh, and he sort of said, well, the figures, they speak for themselves, so basically he was saying, the figures, 
63.0 million, which we are in debt, and as we were in 2012, as Tommy said as well, we haven't moved on. Yeah. I say we as an Irish football, the figures speak for themselves, and that's his legacy, the figures. Yes. Bernard, any pieces grab you? They're all of a similar vein. Yeah, I, I think probably Eamon Sweeney's just around, you know, um, who's going to suffer from this. It's the average FAI employee, you know, yeah. the average wage is 30,000. The payoff was 462, that would have paid 15 of them. They're looking at pay cuts or redundancies. Um, and then, you know, John Green finishes with a similar, a similar topic, kind of saying, you know, um, it's kind of like the banks and the Olympic Council of Ireland. It's the it's the small man and woman on the streets who will suffer the most, and that's the that's the worry. Um, obviously, this is a you know a, a crazy situation, a huge amount of money in the future of the FAI as a as a governing body probably is 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 up in the air. But it's it's how much the cutbacks are going to be at grassroots level to to fix this mess. You know, that's probably the, the something that's probably not clear. There's no clarity on that at the moment, and there's probably a lot of really good people in there who've done nothing wrong. Who are who are suffering from the tarn uh, the tarnished reputations they have by being associated with the FAI and also the maybe the the financial insecurities that they're they're going through at the moment. Yeah. The, the one that struck me and I, and I spoke to some of the employees right. and they said and let's, let's first of all let's praise the, praise the Sunday Times for breaking the story back in March with the the. Um, the news of the 100,000 uh, uh, loan that Lenny gave the association, which the FEI tried to suppress, by the way, and w the officers, who are some of whom are still there, uh, didn't stop Lenny trying to suppress it. Um, but I spoke to some people, and they said, as, as the Sunday Times were grip feeding, you know, mm. uh, revelations of Delaney's excesses, the one that caught them was the 3,000 euro a month rental allowance, and they're going, that's 36,000 euro a year in rental allowance, mm. and he's on 365,000 irrespective of his expenses and these are people here who are trying to make ends meet to keep their pay their mortgage to keep a roof over their head and that's what struck, struck in their craw most of all and they also took wage cuts a couple of years ago and pension cuts and they're still waiting for full restoration of that and that's what really annoyed them that the 3,000 a month for help put a roof over his head when those people on the coal face were struggling to do the exact same. Okay. Uh, just one other thing, and just, yes, uh, final, just final point on uh, this. Yeah. Oh well, well, okay, final point. Sorry, uh, Joe, you're not. I, I, I'm sorry. Well, you you, you yeah. make a quick, well, okay, quick final point. two no, points. Well, then. Couple, Go on. Just, couple, just, uh, just the Sunday Times are the they're, they're headline like the boys in green are deep in red. I like I like that one. Um, Brian Kerr, a lot of good people are discarded, and Kerr has a quote in the Sunday World as well, which is uh, which is quite damning, you know. And he he, he fell out with Delaney and. Um, he was ostracised appallingly oh, from yes, Irish football. Yeah, you, you know yeah, what that's yeah. been discussed, Brian, yeah. but not even get tickets for matches. Yeah. That's what he did for Irish football. Own hand is the same. Own hand is the same. And, and Des Casey, who's a former FA president and treasurer, was given a seat at the very top of the East Upper Stand. Des is 85 with mobi mobility issues. And this was all, all, all allowed to happen under Lenny's watch. Kerr says they travelled first class, they wined and dined in fancy hotels while Rome burned under their arses. <laughs> that's a good, strong quote. Yeah. And, and, I, and, 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 and Kerr, Kerr cares. I always remember that, he cares. Yeah, I mean, when you see the full stadiums, when you see what close to 450,000 people involved in the sport around the country, the most popular sport in many ways, the one we watch, the one kids are obsessed with, it's amazing that the revenue never improved. It's amazing that they find themselves in this well, mess. The bottom line was, and it's touched upon, and I won't go back to it, but they lost so much money in the Vantage Club that yeah. they find a way of funding their, their stair, the stadium, stadium building, the Aviva, and every penny that the FBI got, Delaney got, it went into that hole, so it couldn't go elsewhere. Um, but obviously a lot of money also went into looking after his own, his own lifestyle. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of the, the cabin in, in, inquiry. But there, there, there is a chink of light, Joe, and, um, and while the FBI say they never put faith, they never do their budgets around the fact that the Irish team have to qualify for major tournaments, uh, it does help. And if McCarthy can lead away through the playoffs in March, yeah, you, win, you he, make this point, don't he you? He has to win two yeah. away games. Mm -hmm. Um, it will probably cut their debts by a third, almost immediately, because they'll get they get nine million for nine and a half million for qualifying yeah, for the UEFA. I'll, I'll quote you. You say um, so. If McCarthy can somehow plot a way through, it would wipe off around thirty three percent of the association's sixty two million euro debt. So you talk about well, there'd be no trouble getting team sponsors. That'd be about ten million. On top of that, you'd get a minimum of nine point two million for qualifying. While one win from three group games yields another million. A million, yeah. You might get out of the draw. You might even get out of the group. I mean, uh, that's the, a hell of a pre-match team talk, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mick, you're not doing it. You're not doing it for yourselves, lads. You're doing it for the grassroots. And it, it could happen. It could happen. And. Uh, I think actually that the Irish football team is not as bad as some people make it out to be, and I think I think if Conley keeps progressing and Troy Parrott made his debut yesterday, yeah. you know I think that they have a chance of getting through those two two matches, and if they do, I, th I think uh, Mick McCarthy will be uh, made Saint Michael of Abbottstown because he will have got them out of a huge huge financial hole. Okay, very good. Very short break. Back in a second. More from Bernard Jackman and Philip Quinn. 
Off the ball on News Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. With Jess Kelly. This week, we'll hear why you should consider refurbished rather than new when it comes to your tech this Christmas. Plus, could ride sharing services hold the answer to our climate versus car conundrum? Tech Talk. Tech Talk. With Jess Kelly. Thanks to mintplus.ie. On News Talk. Listen and subscribe to the podcast now at newstalk.com and on the News Talk app. Relaxing afternoons with Harvey Norman. Lose the day curled up on your brand new sofa with our huge range of fabrics and styles. Harvey Norman will have your ideal sofa today. Go, Harvey, go. When does a quick chat become a great conversation? When you light the fire. Whatever you're doing, make the moment even warmer with the welcoming aroma of Bordnemona briquettes. It's At Renault, we're on a mission to drive down carbon emissions. So we created Renault Carbon Rewards, rewarding you for choosing a cleaner car with savings of €3,500 guaranteed on the all-new Renault Clio. For more rewards across our cleaner Renault range, visit Renault.ie or drop into your local Renault dealer today. Finance is made under a higher purchase agreement. Terms and conditions apply. Deposit required subject to lending criteria. See Renault.ie. We've got great Christmas offers this week at your local Super Value. Like Super Value Fresh Irish Lamb Leg, half price. Selected big brand medium selection boxes, three for five euro. USA Biscuit Tin, one kg, now eight euro fifty. And until Sunday, Heineken or Bulmer's 20 pack bottles, two for 30 euro. For the best Christmas ever, it's got to be Super Value. Enjoy alcohol responsibly. All you need this Christmas is carry out off license. Make your money go further with our incredible deals on box beers, multi pack cans, and wines from all over the world. Plus our amazing Eastern European selections, such as the fantastic Perla beer range, now in stock. Fill your cupboard for less this festive season. Carry out off license. Simply better wines and beers. Simply better value. Enjoy alcohol responsibly. Visit drinkaware.ie. Switch to Air Broadband this Christmas and get Amazon Prime Video on us for a whole year. Enjoy thousands of movies, TV series, Amazon Originals and the Air Sport Pack on us. With unlimited broadband for just $49.99 a month for life. Call 1-800-500-300, go in store or visit air.ie. Air, let's make possible. New customers only, 12-month contract, subject to availability. Bundle activation fee may apply. For full details and terms, see air.ie forward slash prime video. Did you ever do something beyond the ordinary? Like swing from the chandeliers, bounce from bed to bed, or soar through a summer sky? Come, get carried away with life at Corteo by Cirque du Soleil. An extravagant spectacle featuring astonishing acrobatics. Three Arena Dublin from the 8th of July. Tickets from 45.20 on sale now. Additional charges may apply. Corteo thanks their official partner, Skoda. Where do I love the most? Paris in springtime. Barcelona in summertime. Rome anytime. And my Air Credit Card helps get me there. Because when I use it, it brings me closer to the travel rewards I love. Air Credit Card. The only credit card in Ireland that takes you from checkout to check-in. Search Air Credit Card. Air Credit Card is a partnership between Bank of Ireland and Aer Lingus. Over 18s only. Lending criteria, terms, conditions and €7.99 monthly fee apply. Bank of Ireland is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Last minute gift idea? The Press Up gift card can be enjoyed all year round in over 50 bars, restaurants, cinemas and hotels like the Devlin, Dulali, Sophie's, The Stella, Tomahawk, Elephant and Castle, The Grayson, Captain America's Family Restaurant, plus many more. Digital vouchers are now available online at pressup.ie or pick up a gift card in any Press Up venue. Christmas is a time for giving. <clears throat> That's a massive hit. And taking. Oh, what a steal. A time for helping out. Welcoming everyone to our home. And appreciating the good works of others. Superb try, just when they need it. Let battle commence. Leinster versus Northampton Saints. 
Saturday, December 14th at 5.15 p.m. at Aviva Stadium. Tickets at leinsterrugby.ie. Subject to availability. Terms and conditions apply. Need a skip, but you're too busy to fill it. Want to get rid of sofas, mattresses, shed contents, or office furniture, but have no room for a skip outside your home or office? Collect.ie with a K are the hassle-free alternative to hiring a skip. Two of our friendly staff arrive at a truck and take your junk away. No job too big or too small. Just go to collect.ie with a K or give us a call for a free quote. Visit collect.ie with a K and we'll take it away. Off the ball. This this is News Talk. Now then, welcome back. So it's the paper review. We have Bernard Jackman in the studio and Philip Quinn as well. We're trying to get through as much as we can. A bit tighter today than usual, given the kickoff times. We've already brought you the Connacht game and we have Premier League action on the way. So, Bernard Jackman, a rough Thursday morning for Joe Schmidt, who would have woken up to headlines which quite literally said, Best and IRFU blame Schmidt. There are a couple of pieces today just uh, picking up on the week that was, including we have... Rory Keane in the Mail on Sunday saying IRFU and New Sephora need to take a look in the mirror. Joe Schmidt's taken plenty of blame for Ireland's World Cup failure, but his former employers are culpable too. We have Peter O'Reilly in the Sunday Times saying Schmidt must stop playing the victim, is the headline in his piece. And then in the Sunday Independent, for instance, Brennan Fanny is saying Rory Best's revelation showed that senior players must make their voices heard during the Andy Farrell era. And then Neil Francis, Schmidt has taken two, uh, sorry, change the meaning of that significantly. Schmidt has too much credit in the bank to deserve this criticism. Neil Francis' piece is kind of an, a very interesting read. He uh, draws a parallel, and he admits it's not a perfect one because things haven't ended so perfectly for Schmidt, but a parallel with Michael Jordan and Chicago and how when he joined Chicago, it's because they were rotten and they were terrible. That's how the draft works. Progress slow. In 91, the Bulls won their first ever championship. They followed it up with wins in 92 and 93, all down to Jordan. The 94 season, he goes off and plays baseball infamously and then he comes back and they win three in a row 96 to 98. His feats in 98 defied logic and reality as he produced match winning performances and seminal plays without parallel in the modern era of sport and then absolutely nothing. At the end of 2019 Michael Jordan still a hero in Chicago and then he says well speaking of Chicago first time in 100 years Ireland beat New Zealand 40 points to 29 nobody puts 40 points in the All Blacks it was all down to Schmidt's keen rugby intellect a bit like the Bulls, there was nothing much before, and I wager there will be nothing again for a long time. Talks about the deeply disappointing World Cup, but then says he's getting too much criticism now. Says that the media certainly are taking almost uh, a certain joy in criticising Schmidt after a tense relationship for a long time. And he says, it is conceivable Ireland might not win anything for a long time, and maybe all of us should reflect on an era of success and sporting prosperity which is without parallel in this country finishes with his last line, let's see how we get on without him. That last line I'm inclined to agree with, I must say. Obviously, he hasn't been perfect this year, but uh, a rotten week for a coach, even just on a personal level, I would think, when your captain comes out and says this. He yeah, I, fe I felt very sorry for him, and I think... Um, so, Neil, you know, Neil is saying that, that some of the journalists are, are potentially getting uh, pleasure from, from seeing him squirm, and maybe it's a bit of payback for... The relationship, the relationship obviously wasn't um, perfect, uh, yeah. perfect over the last couple of years. And Schmidt would have played his part in that. Yeah, hundred percent, and that's the decision he made. You know, and uh, coaches and managers will, will make decisions um, and, and and follow through on them. And results will often dictate whether it's seen as being correct or not. But Frano probably wasn't, even though he's highly involved in rugby, he, he wasn't at press conferences and wasn't didn't need Joe day to day. So he's a little bit away from it, which is probably nice, a nice different opinion on it. And I, I would agree with him. I think that um, Joe, Joe's legacy is, is incredibly favourable. And, and uh, I, I'm not taking any pleasure in seeing him um, you know, suffer. It looks like he, he's suffering because you know, he's, he's written a book. He hasn't thrown anyone under the bus. Um, uh, and people can say that he, he hasn't given the, uh, you know, the minute detail about why it went wrong. And there's maybe a chance he doesn't understand yet why it went wrong. I mean, there's so many different factors that yeah. went into a team um, slipping uh, and it's hard to quantify them all and, and it's hard to, uh, I suppose, give details on them without maybe blaming others. Yeah. And so I think I, I admire Joe's uh, dignity in this. I think it would be very hard for him on, 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 on Thursday evening to, um, to have to go out and, and front, uh, in front of an audience and, you know, having found out what, what Rory said. And, and um, I think he didn't get 
involved in a, a tit for tat. Um, you know, I know Peter Riley uh, says he must stop playing the victim. Um, I don't know how much of a victim he, he, he's really playing. I mean, he, he's not he's not unscathed in this. I mean, I, I I think potentially what happened is is Joe wanted to be successful at a World Cup um, more than anything he's ever wanted in his, in his life, and potentially that affected you know some of the some of the other stuff. But it wasn't a case of um, didn't put the work in, didn't try and find the best methods. He made decisions and there's a lot of people involved in, in decision making in a in a high performance sport and you know the rest of his coaching staff is is head of S and C, he's head of medical, you know, David Nusafor is head of performance, um, plus the leadership group. And I, I know that this is something that, you know, that Rory obviously felt that they'd lost maybe control of the of the week and particularly the end of the week. But um, again, you know, you can see from Joe's point of view when he sees the team maybe underperform um, and they're coming to a crunch game against New Zealand where he knows they're going to have to pull out you know, an unbelievable performance, a performance like the, you know, the, the quality of which was, was 12 months before, that he wants to maybe cover all the, all the options and, was, and just make sure that everybody is 100% on, on, on script. That was the sense I got from him on Thursday night. There was an interview I did with him in front of an audience at a university concert hall in Limerick. And his sense was the players came to him after the England game at Twickenham in the summer, which was a disaster, and they said, we need you to step back a bit. And I spoke to another player who told me that in his time under Schmidt, Schmidt on occasion would say to that player towards the end of a week, we're going to let Owen Redden take the captain's run today. I won't even be there. It's over to you. So this was a thing he would definitely do. I know we think he's hands-on at all times, but he would even just hand over a training session to the players at times. But Schmidt said on, on Thursday, or gave the impression on Thursday, that he did step back after meeting with the players, the leadership group after the England game. And he f almost regrets stepping back too much. And maybe the week in the New Zealand game felt I need to get on top of things a little bit more here. But again, he was certainly saying that he thinks Rory Best was misconstrued, that Rory Best had been on to him. Now, Brennan Fanning says of Wednesday, Rory Best was asked just four questions and yet he spoke for 18 minutes. According to Schmidt, the hooker texted the next day claiming that inadvertently he may have said things in the wrong manner. Brennan Fanning says to that, right. And I think it's incredibly uh, fair of Joe Schmidt to take that explanation from Rory Best. I think he doesn't want to get into a tit for tat, so he's given him the benefit of the doubt. Rory Best, 37 years old, has done lots of media. He spoke for 18 minutes. I tried to say several times to Schmidt on Thursday, Joe, there's about 500 words of quotes here. This isn't two lines which have been blown up and twisted. These are damning quotes. He has said damning things here. And even then, there was a reluctance to accept that. And the same with the IRFU and their review. And I asked a journalist, a very fair journalist, who was at the IRFU briefing. And I said, it reads to me like Nusifor is saying, you know, the game plan needed to evolve. Underestimation of Japan, that reads to me as really damning as Schmidt, even though they never mentioned my name. And the journalist said, my entire sense across the 28 minutes was they were driving the bus over Joe and reversing back once or twice as well. Yeah, but the only person not staying on is um, is really Joe, effectively. So isn't that yeah. convenient? Yeah, so that, that's why I think it's harsh. I, I genuinely think that's that's harsh. And it's not I, like we need to know... Um, but the public don't need to know every detail about what went wrong, but it's very easy to stand back now and, and say, because it hasn't been successful, is, yeah, we underestimated Japan, the game plan didn't evolve. But, that, 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 like, that the game plan wasn't that different in in, uh, in Japan at the World Cup than it was in the Six Nations. It, was, it wasn't mighty different. So, it, you know, what are what are people doing in you know, around that? You know, if you sense that and you, um, early, why, why aren't you having that conversation? Um, because in fairness to Joe, Joe is, Joe, as most head coaches are, like control. But at the end of the day, I mean, he's a really good communicator. And if you have that conversation with him and he, and he, and he really feels that he's right, he'll be able to explain that to you in a, in a, in a very clear and concise way. So, and then you're involved, then you're part of the decision-making process. So uh, I do feel for Joe this week, I, I don't think the World Cup, he played a, a part in the World Cup failure as any coach or player did, yeah. you know what I mean, for sure. Um, but I think it was the best intentions, he doubled down maybe, um, you know, and I would say, you know, Part of the issue is, you know, Rory said, oh, we should, like David Kilcoyne should have played, um, maybe should have played one of the games. Against you know, Japan. Yeah, like maybe Rory shouldn't have played, you know, in, in, in all Rory the games. Rory said that about himself. Yeah. Rory said, at, at my age, to go six-day turnaround to play against Japan, maybe that would have been a lot for me, and, and you know, maybe I thought that was a lot for me. And As if you can't say to Joe Schmidt, I'm feeling yeah. the pace here, six-day turnaround, maybe exactly. we swap me in, swap me out. Yeah, so I think, I think the overall, 
it's it's a collective failure rather than an individual failure, and it's not Roy Best's fault either. It's it's a collective failure, and I think that's the that's the most important thing. And I think for us, the easiest thing to do is to is to, is to is to blame Joe Schmidt. He's gone. It's all going to be fine. You know, the next World Cup. The that's IRFU, not the answer. The IRFU review comes pretty close to that. I feel. It, yeah, maybe it does, but that's. I don't think that's very fair. No, you know, that's my you know point. I, mean? yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I think, I, I, for instance, I think Frano, uh, for instance, Frano, he is, he's coming at it from maybe a little bit more detached and he's seen all the good things that, that Joe has done and, and whoever gets Joe Schmidt next is, are going to be incredibly lucky, whether they're a country or a, a, or a club. Mm. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of people didn't get their part of the, of the, of the job right uh, players uh, and anyone involved in preparation, and we just need to accept that now and, and move on. And internally, when they go back in, and the biggest one, the most important review is, is when Andy Farrell has his squad in over the next couple of weeks. It's the it's the lessons that are uh, and the uh, and the learnings that are agreed upon there mm. that are important. You know what I mean? And if it is a leadership, if the leadership group didn't feel um, they had the authority to speak to Joe. You know, maybe something that's maybe something something that's down to the lack of form of the leadership group. You know, in terms of the maybe not feeling that they're guaranteed their own position on merit, and, and you know, things things can change very quickly in a in a high perform in any elite sport in any sport, and it just seems it was the perfect storm where the senior players maybe didn't feel that they were on form. There was injury, uh, maybe didn't feel that they merited their posi- position on the field. Was, some of the guys outside were in better form, and then that makes it harder to to really, I suppose be forceful with the coaching staff but Joe Schmidt also isn't like he has a defence coach a scrum coach a backs coach a skills coach yeah. you know and I know he was involved in everything but there's a huge amount of uh, you know intelligence and, and quality in the, in the backroom staff as well so I, I just don't I, I just think it's such a, an easy thing to do is to blame the fellow who's not going to be there anymore um, and we all move on but I don't think that's that's the best practice in terms of how a review should look I'm not buying, by the way, I'll bring you in now, Philip, and get your, your thoughts on all this. I'm not buying this tension stuff either. No. That's such nonsense. Like, but this Irish team... A, a tension, think, look, so tension doesn't explain a really, really below par Six Nations. No. And tension doesn't explain the year before how they win. Like, the pressure around that New Zealand game in the November was serious. And going to Twickenham to win a Grand Slam was serious. So, like, the tension thing. And the, you, reason, the reason that Joe Schmidt and players spoke about him so highly and players went back to their own provinces demanding that the coaches there replicate uh, uh, and create the t- same type of atmosphere he does is because they wanted this, this detail and, and pressure and accountability. So you y- y can't be saying, that it, you know, it's what's making us the best team in the world in 2018 and then when it continues, say, oh, no, we, we know what we need to do. Mm. No, we're, you can leave us alone here. And in fairness, even if you did give them, like, the reality was, what does a coach do when he sees the team not performing to the levels that they had before um, in 2018 and, and standards start to drop and lose to Wales and, and have a poor Six Nations, you know, have a, have a poor game against England, you know, a poor game against Japan, does he just sit back and go, look, it's going to work out, cross my fingers? You know, a coach's job is yeah. to react to the situation he sees um, at training and in games and, and, and try and influence. Well, if you, if you said what was one of the most celebrated aspects of Schmidt's reign, people would say the detail. 100%. And now it's exactly. the stick it's, it's to madness. be in with. It's madness. madness yeah. And I'm not saying he's blameless. Of course he isn't. But, like, the simplification here this week is just a handshake. Yeah, but uh, Joe as well. I mean, you have to understand uh, in team environments across all sports, if the results start to, to diminish, yeah. people will, will pick up on little triggers. So someone influential in the team who's not getting picked, who says, oh, the meetings are too long, Suddenly, that becomes something to hang your hat on, you know. And it's so easy now for anyone involved. If that, if, if the fifty people who gave feedback to New Sephora, you know, and they all said, "Oh, the meetings were too long. There's too much tension, too much detail," you know, that doesn't accept any responsibility on their part. Mm. And they walk away and they throw, you know, they throw the gear bag in the in the in the in the, in the storage unit and go, you know, I, I wasn't a part of that. In, fairne- my fault. in, in fairness to Rory Best, which I know hasn't been the theme of this conversation, he did cite the players having a certain complacency in Portugal. But again, I find that staggering. And if he's part of the leadership group, that is very much on them. And I, I would presume he, that's why he was saying it. So it wasn't just Joe Schmidt. So we did make that point. Who'd be a coach, eh? Yeah. No, but listen, it just shows you how fickle it is. I mean, he is, I would say, one of the best coaches um, Still. in the world. Still. Oh, no, for sure. But uh, and now he has to listen to um, a lot of nonsense, I think, mm. uh, and, and people trying to discredit him, which isn't fair, but that's... That's what you sign up to. I don't discount Peter O'Reilly's view, though, that it's also good, because it was my sense a little bit, it's, it, it, your default can't be to be defensive when people are giving you feedback. He may have to 
in the cold light of day, listen to something or reflect on something and see, and I'm sure you'll do that. Philip Quinn. I, I'm not, I'm not a, just a couple of observations, Joe, mm. and um, two things, if Smith, wasn't going if he was still if he was still uh, the head coach of the Irish rugby team, would these comments have been made by the IRFU? Yeah, would they would they've done they do review any year any, any anyway? Yeah. But would would players have felt the way that, they were, that maybe they felt free to maybe be a little bit more critical because he's no longer there? Yeah. If he was still there, would they be in critical? That's one observation. Another observation: slight echoes, best comments, slight echoes, only slight of Keenan McCarthy inside Pan in 02, uh, of maybe a little bit of a schism. The difference being that Best didn't say anything till the. To, to Smith was off stage, mm. whereas Keane was quite happy to let anybody know that he didn't like McCarthy and the way things were going, and they were they were still there uh, while he was playing under under McCarthy. So just just that's just the thing that struck me. Um, if Best didn't feel comfortable, he should have should have spoken spoke, spoken up earlier. Yeah, um, because he was in a position to do so as the captain. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And the one other observation, and again, again, I'm a rugby sort of I'm on the outside looking sure. in, but you, you touched about it there. 2018 was an extraordinary year for Irish rugby. We won the Grand Slam, which we don't do so often. We went to, I don't think we, ever, we ever won it away in, in England. Uh, to, to go to England to win, to win it. Um, we beat the All Blacks. Was that? Uh, we beat the All Blacks. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I think that those results were exceptional, and we got to number one in the world rankings. So like, I think give, give the guy a lot of praise. But when I saw the draw of the World Cup and I saw we were in against New Zealand and South Africa from day one, I'm thinking it doesn't matter how good Ireland are, those two teams, they kind they're of tough. build everything around World Cups. Sure. And they've got but much deeper. The Japan defeat is what's damning. Yes. Yeah, but even if we lost to Japan, Joe, we still would have played. We would have oh, played I know, South Africa. I know, but it, it just it, 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 it does yeah. feed into the sense that well, actually, we were never going to beat whoever was in that quarterfinal because the team wasn't going well. Japan makes it a far darker yes. story, unfortunately, for him. If they had beaten Japan well and then lost New Zealand in exactly the same way, it would have been a more palatable World Cup, I think. So, you, in other words, you, it's 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 you losing a quarter final, but there's there's one way of losing, and another way of losing. Probably, you're still yeah. losing the quarter final. Yes, yes. Yeah. You yes, still have to into a World Cup semi final. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's more palatable. Is it? I think it so. Is, Do you not yeah. think so? You can't, when you lose to Japan, there's a sense that this thing's gone yeah. way off track. Sure. <laughs> defeat is a defeat. Now the reality is, Japan final. actually are are an okay team. You know what I mean? So. It's not as bad as it would have been they four years ago. They beat South Africa in the last World Cup, job. Yeah, they did. Uh, they did. Uh, yeah, but it's just the whole optics of it. And we didn't, we didn't really hit form no. to the level. We the whole year. The whole year. So that was the problem. So what next? Where, where, what happens now for us? Well, then, uh, what, would be, what would be a good 2020? Because you know, if we're not putting much store on, would a win in the Six Nations be good again? Or beating in the, right, in the, the, next, in, in, in the next autumn series and we beat the All Blacks and we're back up again? That would be phenomenal. Or is it all about doing, doing well every four years? What, 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 what do people want from Irish rugby? I know, it's a fair point. I did ask Schmidt, I said, are you, do you subscribe to the notion it's all about what you do in the World Cup and ultimately you're a failure because yeah. two quarterfinals? Oh, or do you look at the tenure of your work, the wins against New Zealand, the win in South Africa, the win in Australia, the three Six Nations, yeah. the Grand Slams? And he said, I still feel very sore about the World Cup, so I can't really feel like a massive success. But he said, over time, I am going to focus on the fact that we were in the top four the whole time I was in charge, and we did get consistent. And so I think he veers, ultimately he will veer more towards taking a nuanced, fairer view of it. But I think right now he's still in the smog, the, rock. Yeah. the smog of it all. Hopefully he does, because he deserves he to should. take a uh, His body of work is exceptional. Sure, yeah. yeah. And he, listen, if, if he wasn't good, like he, you know, the pre most presidents in France, most pre uh, CEOs of, of governing bodies, if they need a coach, he'd be on the mm. top two or three that, on the list worldwide. So he hasn't been, hasn't been damaged? No, he won't be, no, because Ireland, I mean, what he's done with Ireland, well, Ireland aren't a, a South African New Zealand or Australia on yeah. yeah. that level. Like to get to the world number one um, is is an outlier, mm -hmm. you know, and he's he's been part of that. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. So we still have loads to get to. There's Ono Gara in the Sunday Times, Michael Darren McCauley, Johnny Evans was a very interesting interview in the Sunday Times as well. There's Joshua Ruiz. I do though because I just think it's important while we're still on air. I want to reference Paul Kimmage's piece in the. Uh, Sunday Independent, which people might want to uh, read, be of interest. Are you talking about various things here? So it starts with, well, Anthony Joshua obviously has been accused of taking part in sports washing, as it's now called. It's in the dictionary as of last year, that word over in Saudi Arabia, and wonders about Dan Rowan's role. You know, Dan Rowan of the BBC was over in Saudi Arabia quizzing Joshua about it. Joshua almost turned to Rowan and said, well, why are you covering the event? Because you want to get eyeballs on the BBC, so... There are hypocrites out there. I wouldn't agree with that point, I have to say. The event of this, the significance of the event is so clearly in the public interest and Dan Rohn is over asking questions about various aspects of it. That is fair enough. And it's not like he's taking money from Saudi Arabia, nor is he promoting the country. If anything, he's over there doing the opposite. And so, um, but Paul Kimmage rightly makes the point that journalists are often very quick to ask these questions of 
sports people and that he says journalists are often found wanting themselves. And he goes on to talk about the situation with News Talk and the Irish Times, the dispute which is ongoing. I'm sure you remember Fintan O'Toole wrote a, a stinging piece on News Talk. There were aspects of it which the company found objectionable. They looked for an apology. No apology was forthcoming. And so that dispute and that standoff uh, certainly continues. He also references the currency, which he says is um, deemed a competitor platform. And he calls that an unfortunate coincidence given the staff at the currency. I am 100% informed that the currency is not banned from News Talk. And it is deemed a competitor platform, like many other platforms are, and every media organisation has competitor platforms. So that situation continues. And uh, Paul talked to a couple of journalists who appeared on Communicore stations, and a lot of them said, well, he says the theme that emerged was, I care about my family and keeping a roof over their heads. That's my only pr priority, doing the best work I can to keep the show on the road. And Paul says, and that's fine, and I get that, but can we honestly criticise boxers or golfers or tennis players for doing the same? Which is a very interesting question, actually, and one I think about a lot in this job. So there's no blanket answer is the short answer and then the longer answer is tricky. For instance, if you take journalists, how far do you go with that presumption that they need to have a certain moral standing to critique? So how perfect does a journalist have to be to criticise anyone? Because we are, trust me, some of the most deeply flawed people on the planet make mistakes. So how good a person do you have to be to get on your high horse? And who judges that? And also, what areas of your life do you have to be perfect in or good in? For instance, Eamon Dunphy, very memorably on RTE, said to Bill O'Herlihy, of a journalist who had criticised Roy Keane, that's the fella who left his wife and ran off with a young one. Hmm. Does that preclude him from commenting on Roy Keane? I don't know, is an interesting point. And then that's the journalist side of things, and then there are the sports people. So if you have Roy McIlroy hanging out with Trump, if you have someone like Joshua taking the 60 million in Saudi Arabia, I think that is very different to a struggling golfer or a struggling boxer whose livelihood is on the line and they choose to go to Saudi Arabia. I have no problem with that latter point. Rory hanging out with Trump, Joshua taking the 60 million. I think there's, that's a grayer area. So we are full of compromises and contradictions. We but are. It's, it's, an, it's an interesting point. That's on page seven of the Sunday Independent. I am being um, roared at to go to a break. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, it, it is. One point I will make is the World Cup finals are in Qatar in um, 2022. Will you go? Well, if I don't qualify, you know, would I go? I'd love to go. I'd like to report on Ireland, a major international tournament. Uh, am I aware that Qatar almost certainly bribed their, the votes for that World Cup? Yes. Am I aware that they have a ter terrible um, record of human rights? Yes. Mm. Uh, women in particular don't have a don't have yeah. any, any quality of life there. So if I want to be moral about it, I say I'm not going. But yet the sports journalist in the, 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 um, the, 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 the I, I feel the sports pages, I'm not on the news pages, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not on, I'm not on, I don't have a, a radio program that talks about morality. So, but I can understand why people would have, have an issue with that. But yeah, I'd love to be there, whether I'd be there or not, I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it is a tricky one, you've got to juggle with your conscience a little bit, and you've got to remember then who's paying you. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you have to do your job. Mm -hmm. but. It, it depends on on, uh, on how you interpret your job, and, and Paul interprets it there, and he, he, he raises a, a few valid points. Yeah. I wasn't. I mean, Saudi Arabia is an interesting one, Joe, because they are paying huge money to get make a big events. Mm. Justin Johnson played there in the European Tour last year. Mm. He doesn't cross the road for less than a million dollars, mm. and he actually went all the way to Saudi Arabia mm. in that same tour. Remember, where Sergio, yeah. Sergio Garcia gave gave out because apparently he wasn't on the same whack as all the other ones were on. Um, but the, the golfing journalists were all there writing about it, uh, writing about the tournament, yeah. the fact that they had great big names there. Yeah. But, uh, but why were they there? Because they're getting paid. It's true. We've got to take a short break. We're, we do want to touch before we get over to Nathan on the O'Gara interview, Johnny Evans, and a quick word on Joshua Ruiz, the fight as well. Back in a second. The countdown to Christmas is on this weekend on New Talk with Crescent Shopping Centre Limerick. A warm, festive atmosphere, 90 stores and brands, plus the magical Santa station. Crescent Shopping Centre Limerick, the centre of Christmas. There's a new place to buy a Pugil commercial in Dublin. Sandiford Motor Centre, your South Dublin Pugil commercial centre. The Irish Van of the Year 2020 Pugil partner, the Pugil expert and boxer are all available with up to €4,000 scrappage and low-rate finance. Visit sandifordmotorcentre.com. Thinking of a new car for the new year? 
On Done Deal, it's never been easier with Ireland's widest selection of cars from trusted dealerships. Whether it's warranties or monthly finance, we have every option available for you. Thinking of changing your car? Think Done Deal, Ireland's largest car showroom in the palm of your hand. Tis the season to be hunched over your laptop. Not on our watch. At Christmas in real life, you can fill your senses and your baskets. We're laughing emojis on actual smiley faces. In real life, you can browse with the most advanced search engine, your eyes. We heart in real life. Dundrum Town Centre. This Christmas, what do you give the person who gives everything? The kind of person who's ready to leave their home and family to launch a lifeboat and save a life. What could you give to the Iron Ally volunteers who depend on donations to fund their kit and training and need your support more than ever? The best gift they could receive is the one that helps them face the storm. Search Iron Ally Radio. Donate today and help us face the perfect storm. All you need this Christmas is carry out off license. Make your money go further with our incredible deals on box beers, multi pack cans, and wines from all over the world. Plus, our amazing Eastern European selections, such as the fantastic Perla beer range, now in stock. Fill your cupboard for less this festive season. Carry out off license. Simply better wines and beers. Simply better value. Enjoy alcohol responsibly. Visit drinkaware.ie. At Power City, we have a wide range of DeLonghi portable heaters. Save on your bills by heating the room you're in rather than the whole house. To find your ideal DeLonghi heating solution, call to Power City today. Let them experience the ultimate in luxury in Kilkenny with a Lyrath Estate gift voucher so they can choose their own special treat, an overnight stay, dinner for two, afternoon tea, or a spa treatment at the luxurious Lyrath Estate. Visit lyrath.com. Did you ever do something beyond the ordinary? Like swing from the chandeliers, bounce from bed to bed, or soar through a summer sky? Come, get carried away with life at Corteo by Cirque du Soleil. An extravagant spectacle featuring astonishing acrobatics. Three Arena Dublin from the 8th of July. Tickets from 45.20 on sale now. Additional charges may apply. Corteo thanks their official partner, Skoda. Are you entitled to a mobile phone upgrade this Christmas? Get into Carphone Warehouse now and we'll check for you. At Carphone Warehouse, we are the only shops that can check upgrades with all the networks and offer you independent advice. So if you're with Vodafone 3 or Air, talk to our staff now for expert advice on your plan, exclusive offers and the latest handsets. Treat yourself or your family to an upgrade this Christmas and get into one of our 81 Carphone Warehouse shops near you. T's and C's apply. Imagine Bus Connects, an efficient, reliable bus network for Dublin. Taking more people to more places more often. Better for the future needs of our growing city. That's why, based on hearing from 50,000 people, we've revised our bus network proposals to bring better bus services for Dublin. You spoke, we listened. Now we want to hear from you again. So we've opened a second round of public consultation. For details on the proposed bus services, how to give feedback, and to check out our new route mapper, visit busconnects.ie. BusConnex is an initiative of the Government of Ireland. The new Mitsubishi L200 looks tough and moves tough, but makes every driving challenge seem easy. With super select four-wheel drive, four unique driving modes, advanced safety features, including bird's eye view camera, the rock solid L200 is the ultimate pickup for you. And you'll get a 1500 euro trade-in booster when you upgrade your 4x4 to the new L200 before the end of January. Book a test drive at your local authorised Mitsubishi dealer today. See MitsubishiMotors.ie for details. Terms and conditions apply. Need a skip but you're too busy to fill it? Want to get rid of sofas, mattresses, shed contents or office furniture but have no room for a skip outside your home or office? Collect.ie with a K are the hassle-free alternative to hiring a skip. Two of our friendly staff arrive at a truck and take your junk away. No job too big or too small. Just go to collect.ie with a K or give us a call for a free quote. Visit collect.ie with a K and we'll take it away. Off the ball. This is News Talk.
Okay, welcome back. So, unfortunately, we have nine minutes, which is not enough time to get through everything. But we should uh, mention to you, Onogara opens up is the headline with uh, Michael Foley. Really good piece talking about his travails with Dublin over the years and very nice memories of Anton O'Toole. That is on page nine of the Sunday Times and definitely worth a read, Onogara, today. Also in the Sunday Times, and I'm going to come to your piece in a moment, uh, Philip, with Johnny Evans on page five. The thing about, do you know what, maybe turn to, uh, Bernard, I know you like this. In Roy Keane's um, second book, he, Johnny Evans gets a brief mention, and it's when he's a young kid at, at uh, Carrington, and there's some dispute with a senior player in the canteen, yeah. and Keane says that the young Evans knocked the other fella out, and so I thought, I respect this kid, I like this kid, he's got a bit about him. So here we are, how many years later, aged uh, 32, and he's at Leicester City, and he's done a really good interview with Jonathan Northcroft. Sometimes these Premier League interviews are not that interesting goes into detail about the birth of his child the week before, which happened right outside the A&E, where there was some guy having a smoke telling him, you can't park here. And his wife was saying, the baby's coming out. The head was completely out. One push, she only had to push once. The baby cried as soon as he came out. And then there was a midwife who was a friend and had tailed him in the car and she was there and she put him in Helen's chest. And all the time the guy kept saying, you can't park here, mate. So <laughs> that was the birth of Evans' child the week before. The way Leicester signed him is very interesting. Yeah, I think um, that was the most interesting. Yeah. I, I, obviously, uh, Brendan Rodgers has gone into Leicester and he's, he's been very successful. But, and, you know, probably from the outside, um, when they won the title in 2015-16, we, you know, we didn't really see Luke. it coming. Yeah. But when you listen to um, him and the structures that are in place, so when he agreed to sign from June 2018, um, Leicester's director of football, John Rod Rudkin, he travelled to Aldry Edge to make a memorable pitch to the office of Evans' agent and basically had a dossier of every game he'd played in the last three or four seasons. They had them all graded. And what Evans liked was, you know, they weren't all A's and B's. There was a C- minus in there. Mm. Um, and he actually remembered, looked, he looked where the negative one was and was Watford away. And he agreed he had a bad day that day. And he, he, he liked the fact that they were, I suppose... They were cl classifying his performances in a, in a similar manner to himself, and, and not sugarcoating it. Yeah. And uh, I think that's really. I think you've seen guys leave Man United and never really kind of progress to the same level. But he, at 32 or 31, he would have been then. You know, he wanted this club where uh, it was very transparent, it was mm. accountable, and he went there. And he just speaks about kind of what he's learning from a from an SNC point of view. He's putting on a bit of size. He, he's he's still developing. Um, the quality of the younger players they have, and also a little anecdote as well about, you know, his time with United, and he didn't have an agent, and uh, he was haggling a little bit with with Ferguson over his contract, uh, which led to Ferguson, you know, pretty much highlighting when he made a mistake in a game against them. Um, against Milan and give him the, uh, the hairdryer treatment and he was asked what he learned from that, he said get an agent. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, a, it's a really good article but you can see, you know, Brennan, Ro Brennan Rogers is obviously bringing some good detail to it but there's some pretty sound philosophies, in, you know, underpinning that success. Yeah, definitely. I mean, amazing, not amazing given the money in the game but that Leicester tracked this guy for three years and had a school mark beside every single performance across three years. Like, they may well never have signed him. It's a huge investment of time which may come to no nothing. By the way, half time in that match when he's haggling with his contract. Effing wake up, says Ferguson. Half time he came for me again. Had I not learned to kick a ball off the ground when I was at school, Ferguson wanted to know. Going through my head was, I went to a rugby school, but I didn't say it out loud. I can imagine not. <laughs> That's on page five. That's good. And then Jim Carney. I mean, the Sunday game obviously celebrated its uh, tenure yeah, recently. Yeah. And we all know the music. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> but the very first uh, presenter. presenter was the great Jim Carney. And, uh, Uncle Kieran Murphy. Yeah, yeah, uh, one, one of the, the nicest guys you'll meet in, in broadcasting and in journalism. And a um, lovely piece by Jeremy Crow on the Sunday yeah. Indo. And Jim is almost, almost 70, I think it says here. And uh, because it's 40 years of Sunday game, he was the first guy. So time to sort of a bit down memory lane with, with Jim Carney. And uh, on a personal note, I go, back, I go back a long way with Jim because it says here that he, in, in, um, in 1975, RTE came up with a sports show for kids and he was given the task of presenting it. And I remember being one of those kids on that show and getting to meet the great Jim Carney. And he made me feel very much at ease and he was like a godlike. And he was a lovely fella. Uh, and he's, 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 he's been a lovely fella. And still, a, still, a, still a very uh, amiable and approachable guy. And uh, he tells a few little stories about the Sunday game and dressing room interviews and whatever. But he tells a little yarn as well about the mm. World Cup in 78, which I forgot. Orti did a great job in the 78 World Cup finals in Argentina. They had a whole platoon out there, including Billy George and the Examiner. And it was Jim McGee and um, uh, Tim O'Connor and Mikey Hart with the men behind the call the shots went. And, and Jim was there and he was, he was talking about himself and Jim McGee were crossing on a marathon rail trip across the Pampas and they couldn't fly because of fog 
and they pass each other time with a quiz on, on GA knowledge, you know. And as, as Jim says, I was taking on the memory man. He says, "This, by the way, that would be my worst nightmare." Yeah, taking on Jimmy, <laughs> you know, on that train. Like, that Jimmy, you know, on. go on, go on, train me. Okay, well, the memory man, I tell you. Well, where's our hotel, Jimmy? Uh, and they came, nearly came to blows over what was the Tipperary full forward line in the 1964 All Ireland final. They were arguing, arguing over which McLaughlin brother was in the team, you know. And um, <laughs> and then they got to the ground, and then they, you know, and there was the, they they walked in with the Argentinian lads were getting off the bus, and Manotti and Passarella. And uh, there they were right beside them, and much different in those days than it is now. Um, but J J Jim, Jim did one little thing about Jim, and he did the Sunday game, and then he, he had a car crash, and he came back with a tough car crash. And you still, you still hear him on, on RT on, on, on Sunday, and Sunday during the G championship season. Yeah. But he, um, he, he uh, one of the little stories I want to tell you about him. Oh, yeah, the tune background. Tune, he began in Tune, we were talking about your Tullow, Tullow connection and, and, and whatever, and um, the sporting people came out of there, but he came from Tune, and the Tune Herald is where he started, and that's where Michael Lester came through, learned, he graduated from there, and, and Martin Brehney, the recently retired GA correspondent of the Irish Independent. So, um, Tune was giving us some great GA, yeah. great, great GA figures in terms of journalism and broadcasting, mm. and, and Jim Carney was the first one. Happy 70th, Jim. Gentlemen, thanks so much for that. I know it was a, a little bit more rushed than usual, but I think we got through our fair share. Bernard Jackman and Philip Quinn, who you'll be reading across the week in the mail. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate it. Thanks, Joe.